I'm Mary Nichols, Dean of the College of Continuing Education. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this final headliners of the season. It's been another a fabulous year. And before I go any further, you may want to join me in thanking the person who has produced these things. She thinks up all the topics. She gets the, gets the faculty. She makes all these arrangements. Margie Ligon, we have you to thank for this. Stand up. From the earliest experiments in radio broadcasting 100 years ago, to tweets from the front lines of the Arab Spring just last year, we've come to depend on mass communications to keep us informed about events that are happening around the globe. Social media has opened new avenues for free speech, giving average citizens access to platforms that were traditionally reserved only for the most powerful. What role will social media play in influencing public opinion during the upcoming election season and even beyond that? And fortunately tonight, we are ready to be joined by an expert on the cutting edge of media, society, and politics. <coughs> Heather Lamar joined the faculty of the University School of Journalism and Mass Communications in 2009, immediately after earning a PhD from the Ohio State University. Her research focuses on the influence of social media on political discourse, civic engagement, and public policy. Prior to joining academia, Professor Lamar worked in a variety of public affairs and political positions ranging from serving as an elected official to working in corporate government, government relations. Her work has been published in numerous communications journals and she regularly provides expert commentary to national print, radio, and television outlets, ranging from the Washington Post and National Public Radio to Almanac, which I saw you on just a couple weeks ago, and the satirical news program, The Colbert Report. Please join me in welcoming <laughs> Professor Heather Lamar. I have to tell you that I'm going to be in trouble when I get home because I'm married to a former military man. And if anybody knows anyone in the military, you know they pride themselves on being prepared and prompt. Two things I failed at tonight. So I apologize. I do apologize um, for, being, for making you wait a little bit. But it is my honor to truly be here tonight to talk about social media in the new public sphere. And I want to start a little bit talking about my personal area of research. Um, as that very kind introduction mentioned, I have about a, a little bit more than a decade experience in the professional sector prior to my sort of mid-career change to becoming a scholar. And I first got interested in this um, when I was working, I was working on the 2000 and then again on the 2004 elections. And one of my really good friends decided to go work on the Howard Dean election. I don't know if you guys remember this, but um, <laughs> it kind of imploded. But um, prior to that sort of implosion that occurred with Howard Dean, he set this phenomenal new record of micro payments, micro fun fundraising to campaigns. And so I always like to set the record straight with the national media when they like to give Barack Obama's campaign credit for being the originator of social media because truly Howard Dean's campaign are the ones um, that started the idea of micro payments. But as we're going to see tonight, it even goes back a little further than that. But what I find exciting really about this area of research is that this this has been the MIT Media Lab. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that or not, but they have called this, and I would agree, the biggest innovation in mass communication since the printing press. And when you think about that, I mean, that kind of sounds like a really bold claim to make, right? I mean, come on, it's the printing press. But when you really start to think about it, and we start to talk about some of the things tonight that are going on, and we think about just even the founding of our own nation, and the role that public opinion played in that, and the role that free speech and dissenting opinions, um, being allowed to gather and organize played in all of the, how far we've come as a nation, and we think about that in the context of what's happening around the world today, you maybe could see that it is the most important thing since the printing press. So I'll be interested to hear your opinions and comments on that at the end. But my, um, a little bit about my research area, I'm considered, generally speaking, a political communication and public opinion scholar. And I focus mainly on the role of entertainment and social media in the public sphere. Um, 
I look at these both as being alternatives to traditional journalism. So I don't see them as entirely different. As I, I see them more similar than different. And I, that might be a, a strong bridge for some people, but I would argue that what we do with The Daily Show, with The Colbert Report, what we do with political satire and stand-up comedy, um, movies like W, Frost Nixon, The Iron Lady, which I loved, which I just saw recently, um, those kinds of films and entertainment are just like social and participatory media through YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. Um, much of what this is is us figuring out ways as the common public to go around the gatekeepers in the national media. And this is what we're doing. We're finding ways to have forms of free speech and expression in, in a time when we had um, corporatism, raging through our national media. And this is sort of our own popular uprising, if you will. And so I find it really a, an interesting area. I specifically focus on uses and effects. So I look at ad micro and macro opinions. So I look at attitudes, opinions, and behaviors that have social, economic, and political consequences for democracy. And so simply put, I pretty much ask the question of how do these types of media affect us in our democracy? And that's a little bit about me. But tonight we're going to focus just on the social piece, the social media and politics piece. And I want to take you first through the rise of social media and political communication, specifically in the United States, but we'll talk a little geopolitics here. Um, talk a little bit about the international or the intersections between socially mediated politics and public opinion. I really would like to talk with you, and this probably will happen more through the, the Q&A period, about everybody's thoughts and feelings on the changing dynamics and roles for political elites, journalists, and publics. Um, I would argue that this one of the big fundamental shifts that's occurred is the changing nature with journalism. And I am in a journalism and mass communication school, so we have a lot of fun having intellectual debates over there about what the future of journalism is going to be. Um, I guess we need a debate on the future of, of booksellers, too, because I just bought my first Kindle, too. So, <laughs> so everything is changing rapidly in this whole area of digital media. And then a discussion with you. So let's just look at a social media snapshot, if you will, and this would tell you how old I am am because my I can't even see my own writing on here so I'm gonna have to look over my shoulder but um, so this is really an interesting fact I don't know how many of you are on LinkedIn if you have LinkedIn that's one a few of us are on LinkedIn it, it there's so many portfolio pro, uh, profiles online at some point you have to quit and say enough I'm not even going to join anything else but um, LinkedIn right now, you know, it's pretty much used for business contacts and, and business networking. 50,000 people who have a U.S. LinkedIn profile consider them social media consultants. 50,000, that's phenomenal, right? <laughs> My gosh, I got a lot of competition out there, don't I? And then, <laughs> and then um, 200 million tweets per day are sent now. 200 million tweets per day. I saw, I broke that into seconds at one point in time, and it was just mind-blowing, so I just left it with 200 million tweets per day, and 10 million Twitter users, and that, um, there was just a really interesting story, anecdotally, we can get to later in the presentation about this big, I don't know if any of you have heard the big dust up in, um, bless you, in the Senate, um, pri the, re the GOP senatorial primary over Twitter, what's going on between the state treasurer and the attorney general in Nebraska. So this is big news. And so it's a really good example of what's going on with Twitter. Um, one, one member, I think it was the treasurer, was accused of following, you know, for opposition research reasons, the other person running the attorney general's 14-year-old daughter. <laughs> and so all the Omaha <laughs> all the Omaha papers are calling and everyone's just a buzz about, you know, where's privacy and protection and do you have the right to follow people's children and what's what are we going to do about social media and politics because it's starting to get a little muddy. And um, so I fondly call that Twitter wars, and um, I think we're going to just see more of them as 2012 heats up. But the first ones are kind of right here in our own neck of the woods, happening right now in the Nebraska senatorial primary for the GOP. We have over 50 million users on Facebook. 50 million users. And um, there's actually, I, I hesitated to put this up, but I saw new research that came out saying 70, we're up to 75 million users on Facebook. But I couldn't confirm it with Facebook today, so I left it at 50. But really, it, it could be another, we could be closer to 75 at this point. YouTube, I find this fascinating. YouTube, how, ma how many of you have used YouTube? Okay, that's almost all of us. Well, we are part of the second largest search engine. 
second largest search engine, to Google, right? Google's the number one search engine on the internet. YouTube is the second largest search engine now and obviously the largest video sharing platform that we have. Then there's some sort of more obscure ones. Well, they're not really obscure, but they're obscure to a lot of us who don't live and die by social media every day. But Tumblr, a blogging platform, has 1.5 billion views. And when they do that, they're talking about unique site visits. So they're saying 1.5 billion different people every day are logging in to read these blogs. And we now know in our journalism research that a lot of the, you know, we've done agenda setting research since the 1970s. We started agenda setting in 1972, saying that the media gatekeeper, the media sets the agenda for what the public should think about. Well, the new agenda setting research coming out is saying the bloggers set the agenda for the media who sets the agenda for what we should think about. So more and more people like Matt Drudge and Huffington Post are actually becoming the agenda setters for the New York Times and for the Wall Street Journal, and that should give us all pause. <laughs> At least it gives me pause, but okay. <laughs> and uh, Flickr, does anyone use Flickr to share video? On, I have to admit I don't use Flickr yet, but many people in my family do, and it's a great service for um, photo sharing. And I just would have to know more about my camera to figure out how to use Flickr. <laughs> So when I figure that out, I'll let you know. <laughs> um, but it is being used. And so let's just kind of move on a little bit and talk about that. So that's sort of the snapshot of what's going on with social media and how big it is. And, and I like to sort of start with that just to give a feel for the sort of a sense of really the worldwide phenomenon that we're talking about. Even just two, three, four years ago, it was kind of like, yeah, social media, what's that? The web 2.0, that's not a big deal. But it has been an explosion and what do you think, does anyone in here know the fastest growing, if we took um, the demographic of age, what's the fastest growing age group to adopt social media in the United States? I, <laughs> it's 55 and over. <laughs> Right? That is the fastest growing. And the new Pew data comes out. There's been a 100% increase. So over a 100% increase, actually, every year for the last four years in that age group for adopting social media. Um, now, of course, and this would be expected, we, are, we live in a transient world where families move away from each other now and now. And so still within this age group, the number one use of social media is to connect with grandchildren. And I love how they said grandchildren, not children, because that's what my father would say, too. And, uh, but, um, <laughs> but they are more and more. And so in the 2010 election, we found that 53% of adults that were online were connecting with campaign or political information through social media. And in 2011, that was up over 60%, and they're predicting that number to reach 80% or higher in this election. So they are calling it the social media election. So let's look at the rise. And um, who would have thought that back in 1994, that, that is really not that long ago. Really, right? 19, well, I mean, it's, kind, it's not that long ago. 1994, uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein, she is the one who first put up a campaign website. So, and and that, that makes sense to me, but I love this one. In 1998, the <laughs> Jesse Ventura was the first to feature email through his campaign website. So right here you have you know, sort of your own Minnesotan um, landmark. In 2000, and I, I really like this because this goes to my point of Howard Dean. So a lot of people, especially the younger generation, loves to give, um, like I was saying, President Obama credit for beginning this sort of social media revolution through campaigns. And some of us that are a little older say, no, that's not really true. We have to give Howard Dean some credit. But this fact is really interesting because the irony of the juxtaposition between Senator McCain and President Obama in 2008 of being, you know, the, the older um, traditional media candidate in the GOP who didn't really know how to use his, tw use his email, and I think at one point he made a comment about not knowing how to use his email, his daughter checks it, and the young kind of hip president, uh, candidate at the time, now president, who is all, he won a Cannes Lion Festival Award, won advertising awards, won platinum awards, all kinds of awards worldwide for his use of social media, and yet Senator McCain's campaign back in 2000 actually was one of the first campaigns to figure out that that was going to be a good fundraising tool. Isn't that an, I think that's just interesting, so I like to bring up those kinds of little tidbits. Um, and then we've talked about Howard Dean's use of the blogs. 
for voter interest and his moving it to a new level and mobilizing. And then, of course, we do have the revolution of social media in the 2008 election, which I just mentioned. And the New York Times proclaimed that Barack Obama's campaign was the first to actually really understand social media. I have read personally probably about 15 scholarly articles that were dedicated entirely to studying his use of this. And I would say there's probably 100 more out there that are written by popular cons political consultants trying to figure out best uses of social media based on Barack Obama's campaign in 2008 so that they can sell that kind of strategic communication plan to their current crop of candidates that are running for office. So it's getting to be big business. And in 2010, um, well, I, I already gave you this little fact, over 53% of users were using social media. And, you know, as I said, they're expecting up to 80%. But the big deal now is mobile apps, right? And I don't know if you're aware of this, but, you know, the mobile applications of social media are phenomenal, not just for, for politics, but for public health and um, other all kinds of fascinating medical uses. Women in India and rural areas are now taking cell phones out, and when they find clean water, they use the cell phone to use Pinterest, which is um, crowdsourcing software, and it has a geolocator. And they, they mark their location in their cell phone, and it sends a signal out to everybody else on social media of where the clean water is in India. Is that cool? And in um, rural parts in sub-Sahara Africa, they have applications through social media now that allow them to have just right there in the field vaccinations, and they can t check for heart attacks and strokes, and they can have, I mean, it's just like a little tiny, like, EMT kit all in a cell phone. And it's very compact and easy to use, and they can carry it around in their trucks, and they're saving people's lives every day. So I study the political consequences of this, but I think it is important to point out that this is just phenomenal technology that's being used to just really, really reinvent the world. So, okay, so let's talk about politics, though. Um, so we talked already sort of about the rise of it, but let's look a little bit more at the intersections between socially mediated politics and public opinion and what is happening with that around the world. Well, we can talk about the new public sphere in the United States, and what we'd have to do if we talk about that is sort of look at some landmark changes. In 07, we had the first YouTube debate. Did any of you tune in and watch that? And the very first question, I think, was asked by a guy named... Chris, I'm pretty sure, in Portland, Oregon, and he essentially posed to the candidates, you know, now you have to answer real questions from real people rather than, you know, just giving your political talking points and dodging questions. So it was kind of a zinger just right from the start. <laughs> and we've seen the uh, YouTube debates carry on. The, they, we've had them again, you know, every, basically we had them in 07 and 08. We are having them again in this election cycle. And I think they're probably here to stay because they've been adopted did by CNN and Fox News and integrated into the larger scheme. A lot of people ask me why they would do that, and I would say that is survival of the fittest at work because Fox News and CNN realizes that they don't want those just online. They, do, they want the viewer. So what, what value add can that mainstream media, well, or cable media, um, add? If you can just go online and you don't need cable television at all, right? You don't need the, we don't need the pundits to tell us what to think anymore. I mean, and that is threatening to them, and that is threatening to their business model. And so by teaming up with YouTube or by teaming up with Twitter or by teaming up with Facebook, then they get to maintain and preserve the role of the interpreter of the information. So they're no longer delivering it and creating it for us. That's happening through this digital social media. But they're still taking on that sort of punditry role of, of trying to, you know, contextualize it for us and help us figure out who won and didn't win and the those kinds of roles that traditional media has played for a long time. So it's a strategic use for them. Um, oh, I think. And then we saw um, two firsts in the Obama presidency. I don't know if any of you participated in either the Facebook town hall or the Twitter town hall. But um, these were landmark events because we never had a sitting president ever engage in some kind of a socially mediated town hall like this. And so I think that that's here to stay now, too. Um, 
but there is sort of a lower, lower level kind of debate among these smaller players in social media like Flickr and, and um, even YouTube, but, but more like Flickr and LinkedIn saying, hey, you can't do that because now you're the White House and, and if you pick one group, then you're picking winners and losers in social media. So what we're going to start to see now is this kind of debate about open access. Because if you, if you wanted to be part of the Twitter town hall or part of the Facebook town hall, you had to join Twitter or Facebook. It wasn't open access like broadcast television like we grew up with. It's closed access. And that's problematic for when this is a competitive, profit-making environment for these companies. So we'll have to look and see what's going to happen with that. Um, We've also seen a new public sphere in the Middle East. People like to reference the Arab Spring a lot, but can you, can you read that? I love that quote, the structural changes changing our world today are in fact empowering individuals as never before except for the printing press. <laughs> I think we should. It's probably not never before, but it, it is a good statement. Um, this is a picture of the actual um, protests that were going on with the Facebook sign and everything. So that's fascinating to me. And we can talk more about the implications of that a little bit. In a few minutes, I'm going to get to an academic study that actually went and looked at the implications of social media in the Arab Spring. But before we look at that, I want to mention that this isn't just the Arab Spring. And it's not just U.S. politics. This is a worldwide phenomenon. So the Pew Global Attitudes study put this chart out, and it's really interesting because it talks about 15 of 21 countries, at least a quarter of people in 15 of 21 countries that they polled. That's one-fourth of the population in 15 different nations are saying they're using social networking. And the newer sort of more nuanced studies are going and looking what they're using them for. And of course they're using them to maintain personal relationships. But a secondary function right now is, or sort of the second most popular reason to people use it, is to get news. So Twitter is sort of the new news feed for people. And um, mobile apps on their phone are how they're getting news. People heard about this, the tsunami in Japan. They heard about the all of this stuff going on. People in Hawaii got that news from Twitter before they got that news from their local television broadcasters in Hawaii. And um, we've seen this social media save lives in the Netherlands. When the kids were on the island and there was a person who went on a shooting rampage, they used Twitter and Facebook to call for help. And it was people around the island who brought their boats over and saved them that way. And so more and more we're seeing these uses. I don't know if you heard about the riots in the BART transit system about a year and a half ago now in San Francisco. And um, this is a big problem, too, because this is the first time we know of in America that a government entity shut down social media. And this was a big problem, right, because there were riots in the transit system. And the San Francisco police felt that... And the Transit Authority actually felt that the riots were going to get bigger if the word could get out about organizing these riots. And they didn't want more people down there. They were really thought that what they were trying to do was to protect people and save people's lives by shutting down social media. But they were also shutting down the opportunity for people to call for help. And it was sort of it has become sort of a 911 service for people, and um, so there's still law. There's going to be lawsuits probably for the next 10 years over that. But it's a bigger question for my um, colleagues who study First Amendment rights and media law, and they're starting to ponder the question of sort of what are the boundaries here, and when is it okay and not okay for our government to shut the because they can shut it down whenever they want at a flick of a switch, but they don't because we pride ourselves in open speech and free speech and open democracy. So it'll be interesting interesting to see how some of those kinds of things happen too. And so those are some of the intersections, but how is it changing the dynamics and the roles and for the political elites and the journalists and the publics? And I already hinted around about this, but I want to kind of take a little bit of an academic look. And scholars like myself are interested in trying to answer this question, but we're finding it extremely difficult because this is a fast-paced, rapidly changing medium of media. It is complex and dynamic. Um, this is the most recent sort of way we've looked at um, taking social media in the social media ecosystem and categorizing it into things we do. But if you, you can go out into this person's website, fredkazanza.net, and he has one of these done every year for, since, I think, 2007. And every year the map looks completely different because the media in the map is completely different and because the, the way people use the media is completely different. One example of this is Twitter. How many of you are on Twitter or have used Twitter? 
uh, so, so a smaller number. And those of us who use Twitter know something called a hashtag. And, or maybe if you've heard references to Twitter, you've said, you heard, you know, tweet at hashtag blah, 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 blah. And what the hashtag is, is a way for people, like all of us in the room, we maybe don't follow each other, but we want to converse with each other about a particular issue. So you guys could hashtag Heather Lamar, and then every time you hashtagged Heather Lamar, all of you would see, you'd all be involved in sort of this conversation through Twitter, and it turns into this sort of one to some into many to many, and it changes the dynamic. But what's interesting about the hashtag function, it was created by users, not Twitter. Right. So <laughs> we got some pretty smart young people in this country, and they figured it out. I mean, that was never coded or created by Twitter. It's been adopted by Twitter, and it's widely successful, but that was actually created by the users themselves as a way to organize and talk to each other and code. And so these kinds of just sort of evolutions of the media themselves and how they're being used, it, this is so organic and it's so people-driven and public-driven that we don't have a handle on what the boundaries are. It's very difficult to test. I mean, we can't test this in a lab like we do with other social psychological experiments or political science experiments. I mean, I can't bring you in the lab and ask you whether you're Republican or whether you're Democrat or, and what your age is and what your gender is and then, and then have you log into some fake social media site and see who you want to talk to. It doesn't work because it's totally, there's no external validity. But when we want to go out and we want to study it in the real world and look at how it's moving, the actual message is morphing from person to person to person. So if you post something on your Facebook and then a friend comments on it and somebody else likes it and someone else responds to it and someone shares it, how am I supposed to test the effect of that message? How's any scholar supposed to test the effect of that message? Because what you saw and the next person saw and the next person saw and the next person saw was a different message. And so we have this completely difficult, like no boundaries, no rules, wild west kind of thing going on on social media. And we're going, and then every, every time we get an idea of what to do with it, it changes. So we're like, whoa. <laughs> so, so it's really, really a difficult but yet fascinating area for us to study. Um, one study I was able to do recently was looking at the 2010 elections. And we were looking in this study to try and understand how Twitter, whether Twitter actually was having an impact on political elections. So we looked at all 435 districts in the United States House of Representatives. And we looked at every single candidate, not, not just major party, but minor party. We had over 1,183 candidates who ran for political, who ran for the House of Representatives in 2010. Looked at every one of them in their use of Twitter and their followers and their lists and everything related to Twitter. And what we found, um, the, these results were really interesting because we did find a significant relationship or a significant increase in your odds of winning the election if you use Twitter. And what is also interesting is more Republicans used Twitter in 2010 than Democrats. And we know the House turned Republican. And I know I cannot link cause and effect there. If I did, people get really mad at me. But, um, <laughs> but I can bring it up as an interesting question to ponder and say, hmm, that is really fascinating. You increased your odds of winning the election if you use Twitter, and more GOP candidates used Twitter. And we know that the House went to the GOP. What I also found interesting, though, is something that's almost maybe not good news for Twitter, or for, for the use of Twitter in political campaigns. And it's not up here, but is as sort of a side note, one of the things we found, or we expected to find, was that we would sort of use social media to level the playing field between major party and minor party candidates, right? I mean, it's low cost, it's open access, everyone can use it, except there was a significant decrease between third party and independent candidates' use of Twitter versus major party. Democrat and Republican candidates. And we kind of scratched our head and we tried to figure that out because that is counterintuitive. You would think that these third party and independent candidates that don't have all this fundraising capability and don't have all these staff and they don't have all this access and name recognition would want to get in on this as a way to level the playing field. So I started calling some of the campaigns to ask them about it and their answer unfortunately was, well, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's why we couldn't use Twitter because we don't have all the money to hire an army of people to tweet every day and to organize it. And, you know, you don't think about that, right? I mean, at least, you know, oh, 
oh, that makes sense. And um, <laughs> so more and more we're trying to actually talk to these campaigns and talk to the policymakers and talk to the activists and the grassroots organizations because if there's that deficit in major campaigning, there's likely going to be an even greater deficit with small nonprofits and local communities. I mean, I don't know if the Humane Society is able to fund an intern who can every single day update the Facebook page or update the Twitter page. And so they're really, as much as we, we talk about how great this is going to be to completely equalize the playing field between big players and small players, the reality is it is, requires every single day updating, monitoring, interacting, and it is a very, um, um, in just, just a very labor-intensive task. And so you have to have a group of people to do it. I mean, you, pretty much every single elected official out there who's tweeting every day, it's not them tweeting, right? It's a low-level campaign staffer who's tweeting for them. And so it's going to be interesting to see really what kind of major change can be happen. And then if we look at social change in the world, and, and, I, and I like this one too with the Facebook. I mean, this is an actual shot from the streets in Egypt. And... Um, this is a study that was done at University of Washington by one of my colleagues uh, looking at 3 million tweets and the YouTube and the blog posts and everything and they were able to find actual scientific empirical evidence that in fact that, that what we kind of all knew intuitively they could empirically now say for sure that social media played a major role in organizing people and taking down a dictator in Egypt. And so that is a really huge finding. And it gives sort of cre credibility to this field of media because many, many people suspected it and all of the popular press talked about it. But this is the first actual academic study to actually come up with some kind of, um, to come up with some kind of evidence of that. However, there's, I'm running close to the end of my time, so I'm going to kind of end, end here so we can talk about whatever you want in the discussion. But there's new questions being raised, and, and interestingly, this is being raised by NATO. And NATO has a big video out saying, whoa, 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 you know, question here. We, you keep talking about how all you guys are talking about how great social media is and promoting democracy around the world and overthrowing dictators and getting people elected to office and giving everybody, the, the people a new voice, changing the relationship between journalists. Um, there are no gatekeepers. There's no there's no agenda setting function. Everything's sort of a free for all. Anyone can interject. We're back to the world of Gallup, and you know we've moved. You know George Gallup, who believed in the popular opinion expression, and and you keep talking about all these great things, but do you think there could be any unintended consequences or any negative things that where we could say that social media can hurt democracy? And of course, there's two sides to every coin, right? So this is the quote from NATO bringing that up, and they're acting. They're saying, but what about the dangers that social media can pose um, when it's in the wrong hands. And examples that they go through in their video, and their video is on their NATO.org website if you're interested in watching it, um, is they talk about Facebook and Twitter being illegal in China. So it's not really truly everywhere in the world. And they talk about the Chinese government filtering gigabytes of data every single day to keep it a closed media society. They talk about authoritarian regimes in Iran using people's Facebook and Twitter feeds, monitoring them to be able to track down protesters, right, and arrest them. And unfortunately, I mean, I, I, I know, unfortunately, our FBI does something similar, right? <laughs> so, I mean, we're all being monitored all the time on Facebook for terrorism and because of terrorism, because of 9-11. And so it's not, it is free speech, but just like any free speech, it's maybe not truly free, and especially in some parts of the world. And you, it is a public domain, and everything that you say can be used, and um, you can be found through it. And so it might not be all peaches and roses. And so we have to kind of temper our enthusiasm about how exciting it is and really truly investigate some of the drawbacks and, and those problems too. Um, and then, of course, in here in our country, we saw the effects of the WikiLeaks and what happened to classified information. And that sets a whole new stage and standard for us to think about too. And so I will leave you with this quote from the MIT Media Lab, which I really love. If you took all of the information from basically the printing press until now, and you added it up, and that includes radio, television, and newspapers. 
and you added it all up, up until the year 2011. So that would actually even include everything online up until 2011. And you could turn it into a digital number. That number equals about the same amount of information flowing on the World Wide Web every day. So we have information overload. So new questions being asked and something to think about is this thing called the filter bubble. And I don't know if you're aware of what the filter bubble is, but we know we about selective exposure where, you know, if I pick up the New York Times and you pick up the Wall Street Journal, we know we're getting a different sort of slant, a different framing or bias of the media. One's conservative, one's more liberal. But we've picked that bias. What people don't realize is that because of the vast amounts of information out there in sort of cyberspace, these massive machines, um, these search engines, are filtering the information for us. So we've done experience, experiments. We just did one the other day where <laughs> I Googled, um, we just Googled a scholar's name just as an experience. And um, one of my favorite scholars is Dolph Silman. I, I um, Googled Dolph Silman and one of my research assistants next to me using the exact same network, the University of Minnesota, the exact same kind of computer, the exact same Google Chrome browser, the exact same search term, and everything that came up for me was academic, and everything that came up for her was completely non-academic, and it had nothing to do with Dolph Silman. It had to do with um, somebody, somebody, somebody named Dolph, and somebody, I think it was some actor named Dolph or something, and somebody else named Zillman, but nothing to do. And what's going on, there's a book out there now that talks about this, but what Google is doing is Google thinks we need help sorting information. So every single time you log on to your phone, every sing your smartphone, every single time you log into your email, every single time you're on your browser, it collects little pieces of information about what you like and don't like and what you pay attention to and don't pay attention to. And it sorts that information and makes decisions. So it's trying to think for you. Well, if you want to know something about... Um, I don't know, heart surgery, then, and you are a medical doctor who's always out there looking up medical stuff, then you probably are going to get results that are academic peer-reviewed journals. But if I Googled heart surgery, I would probably get tips for fitness and exercise. <laughs> and <laughs> what's scary about the filter bubble is that people don't know they're being filtered. So it's a, it's a different world. Now, if you think about that in a political context, if you tend liberal or you tend conservative, but you want, maybe you actually do want to know all sides of the story or the debate, or you want to hear all kinds of different information, but you tend to read the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal every day, Google knows that about you. And so when you go out and you search Mitt Romney and you're more conservative, you're going to get all positive stories about Mitt Romney from conservative websites. And if you tend to be liberal and you search Mitt Romney, you're going to get all negative stories about Mitt Romney. And so it changes your perception of reality, right? Because you believe that, I mean, if you don't know that, you think, wow, a lot of people don't like Mitt Romney. Or, wow, a lot of people love Mitt Romney. And, but you never are seeing. So more and more and more we're being polarized, even by sort of these Autobots that are deciding for us what we should see without even knowing it. And that's called the filter bubble. And that plays into social media because even on Facebook, you know, I have like 400 and some friends on Facebook, and I couldn't figure out why I wasn't seeing what some of my friends were doing. And what I found out was because about a year ago, Facebook adopted that same kind of protocol, which was invented by Amazon.com. So if any of you have a Kindle, you know that. Or if you've gone to Amazon, it's like, if you like this book, you'll like these books, right? That's the protocol. Amazon.com invented this. And it got adopted by um, Facebook. So apparently, I have about seven or eight people who I click. I must think they're their lives are the most interesting because I click on them regularly. And because I click on them regularly, every time I log into Facebook, their feed is there. But those people who maybe I, I want to know about but I haven't talked to in a year, even my, one of my cousins, sadly, <laughs> doesn't ever show up. And I have to actually now go to my friends and find her and click on her manually because her feed will never show up because I have to retrain my computer that I do want to know about my cousin Carrie's life. And so there's all these people who could be posting on Facebook who you're friends with who you never even see their updates because the machine thinks you don't really care. And so those are really interesting things to think about. And, and that's kind of what I study. So I welcome your questions.
So this is the brave new world we were reading about in the 60s and 70s, right? Wow, this is really amazing. Heather, yeah, yeah feel free to sit down. Well, let's just open this up. We've got a question back here on the right. This is going to go probably <laughs> to my pretty fam- oh. pages of my family um, unless they want to shut that down. But this is okay. Go ahead. Oh, As you were talking about um, the name of the book, I d- the I'm th- having... Oh, it's called The Filter Bubble? Yeah, The Filter Bubble. Yeah, yeah you want to repeat um, your question? I'm having or? a senior moment because I don't remember hearing the name of the book. Oh, it's called The Filter Bubble. It's called The yeah, Filter that Bubble. Is, the name of is the there book. an author? Yes, there is, and you would think I would know how to say it. It's Chris. I can tell you he's the guy who started MoveOn.org. And yeah, where's oh, the mic? Oh, I'm Mike sorry. to the rescue here. Um, Chris Algicara. I can't say his last name. He's um, the head of MoveOn.org, and he wrote the book. And it's on. It's available on Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. But if you just Google the filter bubble, the book will come up. And I will call him and tell him he needs to give me part of his royalties for <laughs> promoting exactly. his book. It's a fantastic book. I read it. I got it at a media learning seminar he spoke at, and I, and I got an advanced copy. I had read it before I even got off the plane, so on my way home. It's fantastic. I've got a question for you right here in the middle. Yeah. No, I think I bumped it off when I said that. Okay. Can yeah. you say... Can you, can you cut that screen? Okay. Yeah, I'm Can sorry? you say a little bit about... I guess what people refer to is the big lie, the, the, the lie that is the, the truth that is told over and over and over again that isn't really a truth and that people begin to believe it because they've heard it so often. The big lie. Okay, well, that's based on social psychological... Re- I, I know what you're talking about. Um, the big lie is based on a series of social psychological experiments that were done over maybe 10... 10, 15 years, and they were actually done, this was done way before social media. And it was done looking at, actually I think it was done after Hitler, after World War II, in response to trying to understand the psychological profile of Adolf Hitler. And what they came to find is one of his techniques was the big lie. And so they studied this concept, and the idea of the big lie is that if you tell little lies, people don't, um, they don't believe you. But if you tell big grandiose lies, it almost seems too unreal to be a lie, and if you repeat it. But, but the bigger finding of the study was if you, if you repeat a lie enough times that you individually will start to believe your own lie, but the other people around you, will, you become so fervent and sure that you're telling the truth that all of those signs of nervousness and twitching and agitation go away, so other people start to believe that you're telling the truth. Hang on, hang on just a minute. Let me... Just a second. Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, the connection between the filter bubble. That's the that's connect, what I'm bridging for. the big the I, the concept of the big lie with the filter bubble. I think I that could be a really interesting study. I don't know that I've read one that's been done, but conceptually, if I were to think about sort of it theoretically and conceptually, I would say that what we would have to predict is if you're being filtered with information constantly over and over and over and over again that's biased and framed in one direction, that you're going to come to believe, it's going to reinforce your views. We did do, I did do a study back in 2009 called... um, fanning the flames of partisan divide. And this wasn't related to social media. It was actually related to The Daily Show, looking at The Daily Show viewers. And we did find that effect. I would assume that if what... So what we found with The Daily Show is that depending on whether you were a Democrat or a Republican, you picked certain types of media. And people who picked The Daily Show, and it has a satirical framing, and they watched it over and over and over. It actually creates a divide in partisanship that goes like this and this and this and this. That's also been found looking at Fox News viewers versus MSNBC viewers, uh, Washington um, Post, New York Times readers versus Wall Street Journal readers. This has been found in several media. So I would suspect we would find it again in social media. I just don't think anyone's actually run that experiment yet. There you go. It'd be an interesting one. We have a question over here (laughs) on the right. Hi, Heather. Uh, I'm wondering, in your study that you did of Twitter, of Mm -hmm. likelihood of whether or not the candidates uh, were more likely to win or not if they had a Twitter account, if you had any idea of how many of those candidates actually managed their social media profiles on their own and whether or not that contributed to their likelihood of, of winning? Well, I would argue 
that it, would, it could only affect the likelihood of winning if the followers knew whether, so it wouldn't matter so much of whether they did it or not. It would be more of whether the, the people who followed them knew that whether they were doing it or not. So as long as they could sort of have that cloak, you know, that veiled cloak of you know, mystery and the followers on Twitter who felt like maybe they were talking to, I'll just use a local person, Michelle Bachman or Terrell Clark in that race, um, that they felt that they were actually talking to Terrell or Michelle, and then they found out they weren't, they might feel a level of betrayal and that could backfire. That wasn't part of the study though, so that would have to be something where we'd have to go and uh, look at audience, because that would also be dependent on their expectation that that was the real person. I would probably argue, I mean, most of us know that if we, if we fax something to Congress or we call Congress and we get one of those nice letters, I used to write those for a living at one point in my career, and <laughs> the elected official I worked for never wrote those. <laughs> you know, dear sir, madam, I you know, read about your problem, and I'm really sorry, and I really want to help you, and then they just stamp it. And it, So I think we've kind of known the cat's been out of the bag for a long time, and we kind of know they don't really do that, um, which is why it was such a big deal when Barack Obama said that he was going to sign his tweets. Every time it's his tweet, he puts his initials. And they are broadcasting that. I mean, in order to, to broadcast that, that signals to us that, that they know that we know it's a game. And, you know, they're not really sending that. But when we really do send it, we'll let you know with our initials. So I think it, it could be an interesting study, but it would depend on how the follow, what their expectation was. I think I need to remember that and do that myself. I feel more like David Letterman if you <laughs> watched him trying to tweet. He finally gave it up. Question in the back here. Um, I, I thought your slide about global attitude towards social media was interesting, and I would like you to um, talk about the distinct difference of the Russia and the Ukraine profile from the rest of them. Oh, okay. Well, um, so you're looking at... In the rest of them, meaning every single other country, or what? Mm -hmm. That that's Heather, uh, that's Heather, actually. Would you mind repeating his question so we can capture? He's him? asking about why yeah. Russia is particularly yeah. different than the other countries in their profile of not interested versus yes or no, and I think what you're um, what you're seeing is that that's no internet, that that's they don't have internet access. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I can actually barely read that from here. So I'm going to have to make that bigger on my slide. So I'm sorry if I misled you. Um, that actually is a number reflecting lack of access. Does that help explain it? It's a lack of access problem in Russia. So We have a question right here, please. You said that the, uh, the blogs are... Inter are uh, uh, Setting the agenda? Are, are affecting the, uh, how the uh, New York Times or the Wall Street Journal uh, uh, slant uh, their writing and, or at least the topics that mm -hmm. they'll cover. And um, if uh, I understand that there's a lot of stuff on the blogs that uh, how, do you, how do you know the person that's writing it is uh, really writing fact or not? And so if the blogs are not writing fact and yet it's uh, influencing how the Wall Street Journal or New York Times are uh, uh, accenting their, their writing, uh, who can one believe? So I wish I had some brilliant state-of-the-art answer to give you, but the truth is we're doing a lot of hand-wringing about this exact problem. Um, we worry about it when we teach journalism students. We, ter we worry about it when we teach even public relations student students. We've had people from PolitiFact and other organizations come in to talk about this. Um, the reality is that we live in a... I want to be really careful what I say because I don't want to incriminate all of mass media. But we live in a time... I did a study a year ago where I, where I asked 435 adults, average age of 35, in the Twin Cities to just look at names of programs and, and news anchors and major news writers, and, you know, and uh, tell me which one is a pundit, which one, you know, so which one's a commentator, and tell me which one is an editor in the newspaper, and then tell me which one's a reporter, and tell me which one's a news anchor. 
and I got negative means, meaning that people got more things wrong than right. And that, and that should give us pause because what that means is the problem is we have fused between commentary and opinion and fact, you know, factual reporting, so tightly to the point across all of our media that people can't even identify anymore, um, especially young people. It's a bigger problem the younger they are. Uh, when they're being fed someone's opinion versus when they're being fed a news report. Now, the question of who to believe is a little trickier because source credibility has always gone to the big, the big, um, like the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. But um, in my dissertation, I did a study about asking people to look at Anderson Cooper and uh, um, not Stephen Colbert, his, his, the other one. John, yeah, John Stewart, and said, um, you know, which one is, who should you believe? And they all said, I should believe Anderson Cooper. And then I gave them information from each person, and I said, you know, who do you believe? And more people believed John Stewart. Mm -hmm. So they were able to intellectually identify even that Anderson Cooper is the trusted, credible source for political information, but they just sort of suspect CNN as being biased, and they think... John Stewart's a straight shooter, so they're going to go with him. And I know I'm not answering your question. I'm like, I sound like a politician now because I'm not answering your question. <laughs> and um, I'm not answering your question because we don't really have an answer because even when um, here at the University of Minnesota there was a landmark study done by one of our political science um, scholars who took Politico and factcheck.org to task and said, you know, you're putting out all this information trying to help us sort who to believe and not believe with the, you know, pants on fire and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But the reality is we checked your sampling and you have a sampling bias that's, that's um, picking on Republicans. And so even those organizations that go out to help us figure out who to believe, they tend to sample from Republicans more often and to pick on what Republicans are saying and they sort of leave their, the liberal colleagues alone. It is a very difficult thing, and a lot of us are very concerned about it. Um, and I don't have an answer. I don't. I do, say, I do believe that um, you have to be very careful, not just in, in exposing yourself to all types of media from different viewpoints, but also um, checking multiple sources, because they don't even have a three-source rule anymore in, the news, in, in online journalism. I mean, I, that really is, I, uh, most of us grew up with a three-source rule. You can't publish something unless three people have corroborated that. But in the, in, we really don't need to blame social media for this. We could go back and blame Ted Turner because um, it's truly this changed really in the late 80s with the advent of CNN and 24-hour news broadcasting. And then it got worse with Matt Drudge and the super scooping that was happening online. And in this kind of fight to constantly sort of feed the, the information sphere and constantly always updating it, they just simply don't have time to go get three sources or they get constantly scooped and then they lose readership. And so they go with one source and then they just print retractions all the time. It's a problem, <laughs> simply stated. <laughs> we started out being sort of cynical, but I don't think we're getting any better here tonight. <laughs> well, and I, and I, but I, but there, but okay, so let me say something positive. Let me say something positive. There is research, user generated research, and this is fascinating that like we, uh, a lot of people looked at like kind of the, well, how do we trust Wikipedia and all this open source user generated stuff? Average people are doing it. There's a lot of people who go online and they police each other. They create these communities, and they keep each other honest. So when somebody goes onto Wikipedia, if you went onto Wikipedia tonight and you tried to change a fact about gray elephants, there's a group of people who police that, and they will be on you quickly. Be like, no, 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 that's a lie about gray elephants. And so it's kind of this self-policing that's occurring more and more and more. So that is a positive thing. I mean, we can say that maybe we don't have as much trust in the institutions, but we have more growing trust in the people. Yeah, those of us in education also, probably joined by colleagues here, feeling like that's what critical thinking is about. And that's yeah. why what we're doing is so important. Back in the left corner there. Thank you. Uh, this question is in regard to electronic petitions. Oh, and okay. um, it seems as though in today's political atmosphere with all the super PACs and all the money flowing into uh, political ads and so forth, that the electronic petition might be a good answer for the, say, the, the 
broad-based public to, to get something up to the legislators. However, my question is, how much credence is given to these electronic uh, petitions that are presented by different organizations to the politicians? So you're talking about when we can all go online and say we support some policy or some act, like yeah, maybe I, I the I get Affordable emails, Healthcare Act or something. I get emails almost every day asking me to, to go plug into this. a particular petition. It depends, honestly, on the level of government. So if, if you're dealing with your state legislature, that is still very localized type government, and they they know a lot of people in their districts and their communities, and um, they're not going to give much credence to that. They're going to give a lot more weight to what they're hearing in their hometown and from people connected to their hometown. When you get to the federal level and you have elected officials who haven't been to their home district, you know, they they don't even really live in their home district anymore and they fly home occasionally. They're very disconnected and also because campaign money can come in nationally into, any, into these districts, um, they get a lot more worried about that. So I would say on a federal level, it is much more effective than on a state level and it's completely ineffective on a city or county level. That, that, the, best, the best thing is still to show up at the meeting and talk to the count, city council right there to their face. Um, but having said that, we're talking large-scale numbers. I mean, if it's a couple hundred people, and more and more they're getting software that's really smart at figuring out what percentage of those people, their IPO addresses, what percentage of those people are actually their constituents. So um, I think, though, it's as effective, maybe even more effective, than the old-fashioned, you know, pick up the phone and swamp the operator's box or the voicemail or flood the fax machine, which we've been doing for the last 20, 30 years. And so I think it's at least as effective as that, definitely. Okay, so we would never have done this except tonight. We just got a tweet in from uh, the Frozen Four, <laughs> and it's one to nothing BC so far. <laughs> That's not a big lie. So we have a question over here. Um, I'm of the old school. I used to watch the news at... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Five thirty and six, yeah. and uh, that was it. Right. And uh, I guess my question to you is, how about the news in terms of trust, verification, and analysis these days? Are we going to get any of that? Are we going to get verification and analysis, or are we? And gonna... can we trust it? Um, I think there's probably still okay. So. If you were to take the Pew data and you were to track on a chart trust in national media over time, we are at an all-time low since the 70s. We dipped really low in the 70s in the malaise of the 70s. We are back below that now. So if you wanted to look at sort of the, the curve of, of public opinion, public trust in media, we would have to say that that has declined. But if we pick it out and we say, okay, but let's just not think of media as a monolith. Let's talk about, um, I don't know, um, ABC's nighttime 5 o'clock news broadcast versus CNN versus some other. Then they still hold their own with the national broadcast. Um, of course, the people who trust them the most are over 50 because they grew up trusting them. And they have a reservoir of goodwill. With that, with that particular demographic. Young people don't even know who's on the news on ABC at 5 o'clock at night. So um, they would shrug their shoulders and say, I mean, when I give my students an opportunity to get news, they go online to get it. And, and, and most of them, quite honestly, don't pay for cable in their, in their apartments. So they don't even have that. Or even, in, and now that we have to have digital antennas for broadcast, they don't even have that. So um, it's generational. We have a question right in front here. Hi. Hi. Um, you were mentioning some of those earlier campaigns, Feinstein and Dean yeah. and McCain and so on. That was pretty early in the Internet years, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Feinstein or McCain or Dean were saying, hey, we've got to get on the Internet. But I'm <laughs> sure that they had some staffers that were saying that. Right. Do you know anything about those staffers, any of their thought processes, any how they lobbied to get this on, what their rationale for it was? Well, we interviewed, I've interviewed in the last two election cycles, people who worked for the Dean campaign, people who've worked for Barack Obama's campaign, people who worked for John McCain's campaign, and I, I also did um, here, I actually did the Bachman and um, Gerald Clark race, because that's of national interest. <laughs> and 
um, there was a common thread among them. Most of them are under 40, and they are um, super users. They're not necessarily tech savvy, like they're not necessarily programmers or, or tech savvy type people, but they tend to be super users who have a journalism background, and um, a lot of them are really um, just very excited and vivacious about the future of this media. And they sort of really are very good at sort of selling the idea that this is the future. Um, however, having said that, when I would quiz them a little on, well, what's your strategy and how do you take what your TV ad is and what your stump speech is and what your debate platform is and integrate that with your social media strategy, right, they just went, huh? <laughs> We're just doing it because that's what everyone does, right? And so... It's, with, it's without focus and strategy, and I think that's where people applaud Barack Obama's campaign because they have strategy. They have, like, an entire ground game, and they have, like, all these connection points, and they're very good at that. And they actually go to scholars, and they, they recruit and hire um, a lot of strategic communication scholars. So it's a whole different sort of game level. Yeah. So we have a question back over here on the right. Um, I read that... Uh Barack Obama, his staff, his social media staff is hidden away behind some closed door somewhere that they're going to blow us all away with something new, new, <laughs> new um, at some extremely high level. And I know that you can go on and join now and um, get on the website. And But do you know anything about or have you heard any hints about what this great, wonderful new thing is and how it's going to blow us all away? And, well, and obviously win the election for him, I guess. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what they could be. I mean, I think that they work with the MIT. Okay, so at MIT, there's Media Lab, and out at Stanford, there's Media Lab. And both in those Media Labs, they're basically inventing the technology that we consume. And, I mean, I study the technology, but I don't invent it, and those people are inventing it. Um, I know that they have connection points in both of those labs, so it is entirely possible that there's some really super cool new platform. But I would say that sounds a lot, just from, you know, here's my cynical <laughs> campaign days coming back. Um, as soon as you log in, they have about 10,000 units of data on you. They know everything from, I mean, just by logging in from your IPO address. And it gets downloaded to something that's about 30 football fields out in, like, the middle of Oklahoma. And this company sells that money to marketers and advertisers. And with a, with a big, deep well of campaign money to buy that kind of data, they really, it doesn't even have to be true. If they just get you to log in, they know more, I mean, they know what you bought your pet for Christmas. And, I mean, <laughs> they, they know what you had, you know, where, what restaurant you're eating at and right now, probably where you're driving in your car, they can GPS pinpoint you if they want to. And, I mean, and it's not just, I mean, don't get scared of Barack Obama. I mean, the Gap knows this too, you guys. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, this is, not, <laughs> this is basically just how, I mean, I don't know if any of you have gone online and bought anything recently. You don't even have to buy anything if you just go online and you just search for, I mean, I have a friend who's pregnant and I searched for baby items and I get all kinds of emails and ads and everything else for baby this and baby that and you know my kids are going into high school I got no use for it but the machine doesn't know that it just knows I looked at baby something once um, so by extension the political campaigns can buy access to that data so whether they have some big super crazy thing going on I don't know I do know that if your interest if it piques your interest enough to go on and log on so that you can be part of what that is when it gets launched they got you <laughs> So. Heather, I don't know if this is fair to ask you, but this stuff is so fast-changing. It's just utterly fascinating to me and sort of frightening, too, but more, more fascinating. I know. I'm I scaring but, us all. Yeah, but <laughs> so if, you wanted, if, you, if we asked you to prognosticate, where is this going? What can you see out there that will be major important social issues for us and even Well, you're going to have things like what's happening in... Okay, so a couple months ago in Canada, I don't know if anyone would have heard about this, um, but there was a big problem in um, Ontario uh, about a political campaign where one campaign tweeted sealed divorce records of the opponent. And what happened was it was sort of a gotcha moment for the campaign that got the sealed divorce records. But there was a cultural backlash in Canada, and I remember talking to the um, Winnipeg Free Press about this, and she was just really mad 
and even as a journalist, that this campaign would do this. And there was this cultural backlash. I had the same experience today with the journalist from Omaha and who was just really mad about this following the daughter on Twitter thing. And so I think one thing we're going to see is popular uprising of sort of trying to define boundaries of what social media etiquette is for politics. You know, is it okay for your elected official to be sitting in the middle of a conference committee live tweeting what people are saying during that discussion or emotionally reacting to the person with, with profanity, you know, about the person who is the elected official? I think a lot of us are getting worried about the, just the degradation of civil discourse. And we're tired of the polarization, we're tired of the fighting, we're tired of the backstabbing. And so I think if I was going to say the future, one thing that's going to happen is people are going to start holding these people accountable for having a little bit more professionalism and decorum. And I think we're starting to see that whether you believe in or support either the Occupy Wall Street or the Tea Party movement, the one thing they have in common, I teach my public opinion classes, I don't... You don't have to actually agree with them, but what you have to see is that they actually have a lot in common. The thing that they have in common is they're sick to death of the lack of accountability that our elected officials have. And as this stuff in the Anthony Weiner mess and like as this stuff keeps happening in social media, you're going to see more and more people, I think, saying, using their own social media to speak out and hold them accountable, which is what's happening in Nebraska and Canada. Oh, wouldn't that be an important and interesting upshot of all this is accountability. I love <laughs> Will you take one, one last question here? Oh, I, um, one thing that has concerned me is that I understand now that for people looking for jobs, young people, that sometimes employers are asking for passwords yeah. mm -hmm. so that they can explore what right. you put on Facebook or anything. And I th that's really disturbing. Well, we're going to have a lot of lawsuits about that. Uh, the infringement of privacy from employer coercion. We've had this in the school systems where principals are coercing young kids because they posted something negative about the hall room monitor or whatever. So those are going to be lawsuits. But it, 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 you should realize that there was a law passed maybe two years ago now, close to two years ago now, that does give, it, it, if it's in the public domain, then it is considered fair um, hiring and firing practices for employers and HR representatives for prospective employees to go search all of your websites. And I tell my students, that doesn't just mean you have to be careful what you post on your Facebook. That means you can't let your friend post that picture of you on their Facebook. Because if, there can, if you're out there, the little search bots will find you. <laughs> and, you know, you're going to lose your job as a teaching third grade. You know, like, so, I mean, this is happening more and more where if it's in the public domain, it's fair to use against you, and that is the law of the land right now. And so until that goes to the Supreme Court, that is what it is right now. So. Well, Heather, this has been just totally fascinating. I'm so glad you, that you've come to us tonight. I, I can imagine that uh, over this holiday weekend we'll be sitting down with children and nieces and nephews and grandchildren. We have whole new things to talk about and be cool, right? <laughs> we thank you very much for thank coming you. tonight.